late month rally helps U.S. markets finish with a positive quarter despite Brexit turmoil. Welcome to the Power and Market Report for Friday, July 1st. program. Thanks for joining me today. Got a great show coming up for you. Uh, second quarter ended up positive and we're going to talk about that. Also we'll talk about some comments by Fed Reserve Vice Chair Stanley Fisher. Also talk about the possibility of negative interest rates and what that means for the U.S. Treasury market. And finally I have two great interviews for today. First Ryan McMakin of the Mises Institute joins to discuss the Brexit decision and what it means going forward. And Dr. Mark Skousen, the producer of Freedom Fest, is going to join the show to talk about his conference that's coming up next or this month and the prospects for Donald Trump. But first, let's get to the market data. So the markets finished uh, the second quarter up in dramatic fashion, uh, struggling late in the month on the Brexit news. But coming back, the Dow finished 1.38% uh, up. Uh, the S&P finished 1.9% up and the NASDAQ uh, fell behind with a half percent loss. That puts the year-to-date performance for the Dow at 2.9 percent. Very impressive considering what we just survived last month. The S&P was also up 2.69 percent and the NASDAQ, uh, the loan uh, one out, was down 3.29 percent. Now gold has been an incredible performer so far in 2016. It finished uh, Q2 with a 7.5 percent gain, that's the GLD, uh, and with a 24.65% year-to-date gain. Now earlier today, the Federal, Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Stanley Fisher uh, spoke and said it was, quote, too soon to tell whether Britain's vote to leave the European Union had changed the U.S. economic outlook. Uh, I think that it hasn't really changed that much in the sense that it's the same bubble that existed before the Brexit. Uh, but now that thing has come face to face with what might be a pin. Uh, when asked about the possibility of negative interest rates in the U.S., he replied, one of the things you learn if you're a central banker is never say never, but there's one thing we don't want to do. We have no plans to move into negative territory and we will try to avoid ever getting into that position. Uh, very interesting. Now I think that all of this talk, uh, basically which has shifted, right, from being talk of tightening to talk of remaining pat or possibly going into an uh, easing cycle and then even going negative or applying more QE really changes the focus. And I think uh, if we look at uh, U.S. Treasuries, and here's a chart of the yield, uh, we see that as low as they are, they can still go lower. So if you look at last year compared with this year, uh, definitely uh, more room to go. It's gone down a lot and it can go down further. And I think if you look around the world and you see how much of the, of the debt, the sovereign debt, is trading in negative territory, you think that that would make U.S. Treasuries extremely attractive. And uh, it's a bit of a curiosity why they haven't been more attractive. But if you think about it, uh, go back a few months uh, or half a year, uh, which economies would you say were the strongest? Uh, that would be you know, the American economy and, and probably uh, the UK economy. Certainly those were the only two regions where you could even uh, talk about having rate increases, although in my opinion not very credibly, but at least uh, markets would entertain that. Now with what's happened in Britain, uh, obviously that is off the table for them. There, Mark Carney is actually talking about rate cutting or QE. And then as this progresses, the chance uh, of a US rate hike are also diminishing. And I think that possibility of a rate hike, however unlikely as it was in my view, uh, was the only thing keeping investors away. So I think that we're going to see a tremendous shift from uh, sovereigns, uh, some of which are yielding negative into uh, U.S. Treasuries, so I'm, I'm very bullish uh, on those holdings at this point. And welcome back. I'm joined now by Dr. Mar Mark Skousen. Dr. Skousen is editor of Forecasts and Strategies and is a nationally known investment expert, economist, university professor, and author with more than 25 books. He is currently a presidential fellow at Chapman University, 
where he was recently named one of the 20 most influential living economists. He holds a PhD in monetary economics from George Washington University. Dr. Skousen, welcome to the Power and Market Report. It's a real pleasure to have you joining me today. How are you? I'm doing really well, and I love the title. Of course, that's Murray Rothbard's uh, famous book, Power and Market. I don't know if you've read it or not, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. Certainly, it's, it's no coincidence that uh, the show is named Power and Market. Uh, I did leave out one important note uh, from your bio, and that is you're also the producer of the Freedom Fest uh, uh, conference, which takes place every July. So I want to talk about that uh, this afternoon. But before we get there, I just want to talk a little bit about Austrian economics, uh, as you are uh, an Austrian economist, and investing. And uh, in particular, I really enjoyed your recent interview with Tom Woods, where you talked about uh, investing, and I think you and I share something in common, which is somewhat rare, and that is uh, the view that Austrian economics by itself doesn't, uh, isn't sufficient to be successful at investing, and sometimes can be harmful if one focuses too much on the business cycle. I uh, use the analogy of someone learning to ride a motorcycle. When I, when I was uh, being taught how to ride, I was taught if you look at the lamppost, you'll hit the lamppost. And uh, I think investors go wrong sometimes if they focus too much on the business cycle, the boom of which can take a very long time to materialize. You know, that's a very interesting point, and uh, it's one of the things, I, I, I've written a book called A Viennese Waltz Down Wall Street, and uh, I guess the same thing would apply to the, uh, to the dance idea, do you follow uh, the uh, footsteps of the ups and downs, or do you look at the, the flow that you're moving along, uh, a a a along the uh, more of a long-term perspective? Uh, because there is, uh, th this was an issue uh, in the uh, uh, economics profession uh, uh, as well, the Keynesian economists coming out of the Great Depression focused on the uh, boom-bust cycle, the ups and downs of the economy and how they could minimize that, uh, versus economic growth, looking at the long-term upward perspective of how do you grow an economy. And uh, I guess there's a similar comparison there in the investment markets. Uh, do you focus on the bull and bear markets or do you look at the long-term uh, performance of the economy? And I, I must say that uh, because of the nature of the Austrian theory of the business cycle uh, from Mises and Hayek, the fact that uh, the government's uh, constantly increasing the money supply and creating an artificial market, uh, the focus tends to be, well, since the market is artificially high, it's got to collapse at any time. And so there's a tendency to be super bearish uh, and almost all Austrian fin finance people that I know of are, are looking for the next uh, collapse to occur at any time. A lot of publicity promotions are around that concept, and they kind of ignore the long-term trends. It's kind of like, uh, to quote uh, Keynes, who is uh, kind of the contrarian from all of these points of view, he said, do you, do you look at the oceans? Do you look at the... Uh, the, the waves and stuff, or, or do you look at uh, the tides and, uh, um, and, and, you know, the ripples and the small changes in the marketplace versus the long-term uh, trends? Yeah, great, great points. And, you know, there's so few of us uh, in this business, meaning Austrians in finance, perhaps there's a little bit of Dar uh, Darwinism at work. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, Well, uh, I do consider myself a survivor. That's for sure. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Darwin once said that uh, what's really important, I quote this in the Maxims of Wall Street, uh, that what's important is uh, not your level of intelligence, but your, your ability to adjust to the, the new environment. And I think a lot of us uh, uh, consider, I consider myself a survivor because a lot of, I've, I've written my investment newsletter, Forecasts and Strategies, since 1980 when Reagan was elected president. So I've been doing it for 36 years and I consider myself a survivor as opposed to many other investment writers out there that uh, eventually had to hang it all up because they had made one blunder after another trying to make a short term prediction. Right, uh, which can be hazardous. Uh, getting back to sort of uh, 
the Austrian bent toward focusing on the bust. I, I kind of feel it's sort of like people who invest according to their tastes and avoid investments that don't agree with their taste. And, and an example would be someone who doesn't invest in tobacco companies because uh, they're against smoking for one reason or another. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons Austrians uh, focus on the bust is because they correctly, I think, uh, sense the, the unfairness of the whole thing, of how, yes, wealth is being created, but wealth is also being shifted by the central bank from one class to another. And because of uh, just the unfairness of it all, it's repulsive. Yeah, I think another example in economics is uh, do you look at economic growth, the how, how big the pie is getting, or do you look at the distribution of the pie, how it's cut up, how it's broken up? And uh, I like to view it as, an ex uh, as uh, looking at the pie as a whole and how we, how we can expand it and focusing on, on uh, the growth uh, aspects of it. There's all kinds of uh, implications of this uh, approach to how you, uh, how you invest. By the, by the way, I should just tell you that uh, a classic example of this is everyone coming out of their woodwork saying that uh, Brexit... Um, British leaving the EU, EU is going to cause an absolute collapse in the economy and the stock market. And certainly when it comes to the latter, you saw a couple of days of uh, a sharp sell-off, but then you've had a uh, significant recovery since then that surprised a lot of people. Right, yeah. So uh, I, I stayed 100% invested during this time period. And I'm glad I did to try to, instead of trying to figure out... Uh, the uh, short-term uh, ebbs and flows of the marketplace. Mark Skousen joining me right now. Uh, I want to talk about your investment philosophy and especially as it pertains to the recent uh, move, the Brexit, all of the volatility. Uh, you said that you stayed fully invested the, uh, the entire time. I want to know, uh, first of all, how that worked out for you and did gold bullion play a role uh, throughout that crisis in, in perhaps stabilizing yes. the portfolio. It did very well. Yes, it did, and, and I'm still in it. I have a, uh, uh, I added gold, particularly a, a mining royalty company called Franco Nevada. It's kind of a conservative way to play it rather than gold bullion itself. Um, and uh, I, this is one of my better calls. I uh, got out of gold and silver and just sold out completely in late 2011, uh, pretty much near the top, and then uh, did not get back in uh, for five years, and in February of this year, finally moved back in, and our investment in gold is up 40%. It's outperformed all of our other investments, but I'm still beating the market this year with a well-diversified portfolio. My strategy is to invest in uh, good quality companies that are in industries that are expanding, like healthcare, and uh, buying uh, stocks that pay above average dividends and have a rising dividend policy. And I've gotten quite a few of those in my portfolio, and it's really done well this year. Can you give uh, the listeners kind of an idea of uh, what that asset allocation would look like, uh, the breakdown between equities, metals, uh, metals gold gold stocks and fixed income yeah i only have one gold stock i do have an energy position we have a 15 percent position in commodities in general and uh, then i have a like a 15 percent position in financial stocks uh, uh 15 percent position in healthcare stocks and then the rest are in various mutual funds that have tended to do well over the years uh, I do not have a bond position at all. I think there's more money to be made in dividend-paying stocks, so I've completely sold out of our bond position quite a few years ago. Um, and uh, just just one gold position at this time. Uh, there's a lot of volatility. A lot of my conservative investors uh, do not feel comfortable with a large gold position. And I've seen people over the years... Uh, have too much position in gold, and when you get in these long bear markets that last five, ten, or twenty years, it can be pretty devastating. So we we try to keep it to uh, to a, a reasonable amount. Right, those down years can be very tough. Um, I, I want to ask you though: Are you concerned 
given, I guess, the popularity now of some of those positions, g given what's going on, a lot of people, you know, the yields being so low, people have moved to sort of lower beta, dividend paying stocks. Uh, do you feel that there's a possibility that that trade can become a little bit crowded and you can be overpaying? Yes, uh, I've always been concerned that uh, uh, that income producing stocks, income in growth stocks can be uh, too popular. And when I go to the money shows and other investment conferences, I see more and more people saying how to earn high income. Uh, it does concern me. And uh, the Fed is, a, is creating a bit of this uh, bubble in this uh, market. And so at some point it might uh, come down. But at the same time, I mean, I recommend uh, a business development company called Main Street Capital. And whenever I go to these shows, I just say, by a show of hands, how many have ever heard of this stock? And of course, it's an extremely small minority and they're mainly my subscribers. And I feel as long as that's the case, as long as not every hand is going up or even half the hands are going up, I feel like uh, we're still in a uh, an investment that can can pay good uh, good dividends, as they say. Uh, I've also heard it could have been on the Tom Woods interview we're talking about REITs. Uh, can you give me your opinion on REITs? Are, are you interested in them, commercial, residential, mortgage? Uh, if yes, so, okay. I've been uh, very bullish on real estate investment trusts uh, across the board, including Omega Healthcare Investors, which is the largest nursing home REIT. Uh, but uh, investors need to understand that if uh, interest rates uh, jump uh, and rise suddenly, uh, real estate investment trusts are, are going to be hit initially, uh, rightly or wrongly. They're all painted in the same picture, and so uh, investors need to recognize that they're going to they're going to be hit with uh, a, a sell-off uh, during that time period. It uh, doesn't really bother me, uh, particularly because I, I think the income side of it is going to be very strong. And, and if they have a sound uh, basis for running their businesses and, and their commercial real estate and residential real estate, that, that'll, that'll, be, uh, that'll be okay. We need to watch out for leverage, however. There's a lot of leverage REITs that uh, I would uh, stay away from. Okay, uh, and what kind of uh, yield can we expect on, for example, the nursing home REIT? Well, that's over 7% right now, and they've uh, increased their Omega Healthcare has increased its dividend, uh, well, I don't know, 15 times in a row. So they're doing very well, but of course, uh, they re do rely on uh, Medicare, and uh, that uh, pay payments, uh, government is trying to streamline, and and cut costs, uh, and uh, so there is a lot of skepticism by investors. Uh, Omega Healthcare is actually down this year, just slightly, but uh, uh, down a little bit this year because investors are, are concerned about that. So there's always something out there, but the dividends have been very strong, and um, I'm willing to hold on. Okay, uh, not a lot of time left, Dr. Skousen, so I want to switch gears. Talk about Freedom Fest, it's coming up. July 13th. This is going to be my first time. I've been wanting to go for a very long time and so I'm excited to be uh, part of the party this year. You've had some just great speakers over the years. Uh, this, this year's roster is no exception, but I want to talk about last year. You had Donald Trump speak. Back then he was just a hopeful. Now it looks like he's got a reasonable shot at becoming the president. Can you give me some, some quick thoughts on him? What were your impressions, first of all, last year and then now as a presidential candidate? Right. He came uh, on July 11th, 7-11 in Vegas. It was his lucky day, and it really put us on the map. We were covered by all the major networks uh, all day long for his appearance at Planet Hollywood. It was a circus. He sold uh, standing room only, uh, 2,500 people there, people sitting in the aisles, police everywhere. It was really amazing, but of course it was very controversial because he's not really a libertarian. We were criticized for it, but uh, my feeling was we're an open forum. We're willing to hear what he has to say. This year, we hope to jumpstart Gary Johnson Libertarian Party. He and William Weld are going to come, and uh, that's one of our uh, keynote speakers this year. And we also have George Foreman and Don King coming, which is fortuitous because Muhammad Ali died this year, and we're going to hear what they have to say about that as well as their 
uh, great entrepreneurship. Uh, that's going to happen. We have Senator Rand Paul and Senator Ben Sass coming. Um, we have our uh, a big de- our mock trial this year is the global global warming on trial. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we have uh, the we have John Mackey, the number one capitalist, uh, Whole Foods, uh, debating the number one socialist, Professor John Romer from Yale University uh, on capitalism versus socialism. Uh, we're going to debate Donald Trump, pro or con. Uh, we're going to have a big Bible debate, a good book or bad theology between Dinesh D'Souza and Michael Shermer. Doug Casey has a first novel out called Speculator that's winning the Leonard E. Reed Book Award. Read this book. Uh, it's uh, we have the the we have a lot of business leaders there that are coming. In in addition to John Mack, we have Steve Forbes, of course. We we've, we've got um, Kevin Harrington, one of the original Shark Tank uh, judges. Uh, we have Larry Elder and Michael Medved. We have Judge Andrew Napolitano. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it's a three and a half days of celebrating great ideas, great books, great thinkers. Uh, most of our speakers attend all three days. We have a huge media. We have all our reason and all the uh, fee and and uh, 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 Cato and Heritage. All the free market think tanks are there. So. It's quite a party. It's a true festival, and then we have our big Saturday night banquet. So I hope people can uh, join us. We're at freedomfest.com if you want more information, and we still have tickets available if people are interested in in signing up. Sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, one of the things that impresses me is you do generate some controversy, uh, which is good, and somehow you manage to get all these people together in a room and they don't kill each other. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons is our debates are always formal and civil, so you're not talking over each other. And, and we try to avoid the labels and the divisiveness that uh, often associates with uh, Fox News and MSNBC and that sort of thing. We're there looking for best solutions, not for who wins, but what is the best policy. Uh, where are we going wrong? How can we make changes? And there's, there's kind of a sense of optimism you haven't been to Freedom Fest, when you walk in, you feel an incredible electricity. Like Nathaniel Brandon said, I haven't felt an electricity like this in years. And so we're bringing that back. And it's nice to get together in Las Vegas. Uh, everybody stays inside because it's a super hot uh, climate outside. And, and then they go out in the evening and, and go to a great show or go to one of the five-star restaurants. And, I mean, it's uh, people... People don't take very much time to sleep during the three and a half days that we do Freedom Fest. And Steve Forbes and John Mackey of Whole Foods, they're there all three days. So these are busy executives who realize that this is where, this is where everybody meets to learn from each other, to network, and to celebrate liberty and what's left of it. We have a film festival, too, by the way, an Anthem Film Festival, which is very popular. The world's only libertarian film festival. Yep, indeed. Okay, and my guest has been Dr. Mark Skousen. Please check out his website at www.markskousen.com. Check out the Freedom Fest uh, website at freedomfest.com. And Dr. Skousen is also on Twitter at markskousen1. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's, it's been a great honor, and I look forward to seeing you in Vegas. Great. Thank you very much, Albert. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Welcome back. I'm joined now by Ryan McMakin. He's the editor and publisher of Mises.org. Ryan, thank you very much for joining me on the Power and Market Report. It's great to talk to you again. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be here. I really enjoyed your uh, interview on, I believe it was Mises weekend the other day. It was uh, The Brexit Earthquake was the title. You had a great discussion with Jeff Dice about the Brexit. And, and this, I think, is uh, a great topic. Uh, it lingers on. So uh, I want to get your opinion, first of all. We've had the Brexit, uh, kind of an overwhelming turnout, actually, for the, for the leave, for, for the exit side. 
there are still some people talking about you know a second referendum or parliament not honoring it or general election what does the brexit mean first of all do you think it'll stick and and what are the ramifications of this well unfortunately i don't know enough about the on the ground situation in the uk to know just how strong the uh the effort is to simply have parliament ignore the matter now in the past that's been common for the eu to simply ignore local referendums. Uh, Ireland and other countries have voted to uh, either not adopt or to severely modify their agreements with the EU. And the EU just said, oh, well, we'll just hold another vote. And then they do that. And then they manage that they, they give some piddling, tiny little concessions. And then they manage to, to break their 50 percent approval barrier. And then they just they just steamroll ahead. So the EU does have a habit of uh, ignoring these things. It seems maybe in this case, though, that uh, it's it, it's not as likely. Some of that's just related to the fact that democratic institutions are more well developed in uh, the UK than in other places. And uh, just the fact that they seem to have more notable supporters of Brexit in this case. There were actually surprisingly number surprising number of, of wealthy uh people as well as celebrities even as well as prominent politicians who actually did support brexit in this case i don't think you saw that in other cases uh where there was opposition that, and they were more easily able to marginalize the opposition as some sort of fringe group but in this case there was indeed a lot of mainstream support for leaving the eu yeah um you know there seemed to be a lot of the rank and rank rank and file uh, if you take out London, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, it pretty much all went to the exit camp. And uh, one of the topics that you discussed with Jeff was that, uh, you know, are people here voting with their pocketbooks? Or are they voting out of principle? I definitely saw a little bit of both. The most vocal people, I think, were voting on principle. But a lot of people, it looks like they were just voting their job. So you, you have people in London, you know, the, the International Center of Finance, uh, voting to stay uh, because of the impact on their jobs. But then you saw people in the surrounding areas voting uh, to exit, and I think a lot of it had to do with their jobs, their livelihood. Yeah, I think you can make the case that if you're wealthy and doing well, you voted to remain. And uh, if things are going less well for you, you voted for exit. It, it seemed to be in many ways a referendum just on the status quo, and that people outside of the uh, the seat of power in uh, in London in the financial sector, people who are doing fine, they're upper middle class and so on. They all love the idea of the EU, but uh, people who are who are powerless and uh, seem to uh, be facing a world economy beyond their control, they certainly had more reservations about the EU. Yeah, and further to that point, uh, you know, we talk about, for instance, Scotland having a sort of a referendum uh, on independence. Yet they voted 62% in favor of staying the EU. So is this a case, again, of them basically thinking that they can just get a better deal with the EU and not really caring so much about what you know, true independence really is? Sure. Well, uh, it does seem to be that way. <laughs> Certainly when we were talking about the uh, the independence referendum back in 2014 for Scotland, uh, there was much discussion about why would they vote away their pensions. Essentially, Scotland is a, a tax receiver portion of the UK. And uh, so why would they cut themselves off from all that uh, lucrative uh, tax revenue that comes in through the more um, productive workers that are mostly in England and in the, the London metro area? So all the wealth is produced in England for the most part, but a lot of it flows to Scotland. And uh, so Scotland may fear then that uh, somehow they're, they're under attack by the Brexit vote or that maybe their, their pensions will become uh, less lucrative and so they look toward the EU. Now, there's, I'm sure there's other things uh, at work as well and maybe Scotland uh, is looking to Ireland uh, as maybe a model as well. I know that Scotland back when they were talking about independence was talking about uh, joining Scandinavia in kind of an international league. Um, and so it seems there's just some dissatisfaction with England in general. Uh, and Ireland has benefited greatly from being in the EU. They've been a huge receiver state. Massive amounts of money have flowed from wealthy people in the EU to Ireland. And uh, so maybe maybe Scotland thinks that is attractive. It's important to, to keep in mind, however, that Scotland has about 5 million people. And 
the population of the UK is 65 million. So this is a very small part of the UK. So if they leave, it's not going to be a big impact on uh, on England in terms of demographics. What you know, one could say that their ability to leave uh, the UK really hangs on their ability to you know, remain in the EU or in some other uh, group. Would you say being, like you said, a debtor nation? Yeah, I mean, why would, they, yeah, that, being totally independent, I don't see why that would uh, be attractive to them at all, at least not in the economic sense. I mean, people have been known to leave political associations based on uh, things other than money. Um, and in fact, the Americans, when they left the British Empire, uh, placed themselves in a perilous position in terms of uh, economic benefits. Uh, but it worked out for them. And and the, may, the same could be true uh, for Scotland. But certainly, yes, it seems hard to imagine them deciding to go independent of both the EU and England uh, when it's a relatively low income country compared to many other northern European states. OK, what do you think that this means for the future of the EU? It's, it, with the way I look at it, it's hard to imagine a Germany or a France leaving. But at the same time, I think the fact that the UK has opted out gives Germany a lot of power in the sense that uh, just, you know, the precedent set by the UK stepping uh, out gives Germany a louder voice and perhaps maybe Germany asserting themselves more in the negotiations could spell trouble for some of the weaker na uh, nations, when it, like the Grexit, for example, when it comes to them negotiating. Uh, do you think that this could result in one of the weaker nations opting to step away? Uh, yes, if I were one of the smaller, weaker countries, I would definitely fear Germany. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm not sure <laughs> how Poland feels about Brexit, but I don't think it's to their advantage uh, at all. I've been in spats with the Germans uh, before over EU matters. And of course, the, the weight of history is very immense uh, with some of these countries that, that neighbor Germany. And Germany has started to flex its muscle as well. The Germany has long kind of... Uh, justified its uh, international meddling on the grounds that, well, they're providing most of the money uh, to the EU and to a lot of these international projects, so they should be able to get to say what happens. And Germany has long just fancied itself as this country that uh, it no longer really does anything militarily, it doesn't really flex its muscle in terms of state power, but it just pays for things and uh, and it, it, uh, it just helps uh, Europe along by being the productive engine of Europe. However, uh, with parts of Europe wanting bailouts and, and starting to threaten to not pay back their debts, many of which are owned by Germans, Germany, as we saw in the case of Greece, really started to get nasty and uh, started to uh, really uh, ignore what it was that Greece wanted and to really uh, start to assert itself. And we see that now all of these politicians who have been the most hysterical over Brexit have been out of Germany. And uh, the Germans have been real nasty about saying, oh, we're not going to do any trade with you Brits now and we're going to make you pay. And uh, it's not very attractive uh, on the parts of the Germans. At the same time, you can uh, sort of sympathize with the fact that with, with the UK gone, aren't they just going to have to shoulder a bigger part of the burden themselves? Oh, certainly they will. And I think that's a big reason why the UK is certainly more in peril now is they just lost one of their huge uh, wealth generators in the UK. You could imagine in the US if, say, uh, New York, California, and uh, let's say, what are some of the other uh, big wealth producing country or states, uh, like uh, mostly northern and western states, the Massachusetts, Washington State, Texas, to a certain extent. If those states left, well, what would what would Mississippi do? What would West Virginia do? Uh, <laughs> they where would they get all the money for all of the Social Security, all the transfer payments that take place? South Carolina, which which lives massively on military spending, most of which is financed by northern and western rich states. Uh, yeah, it would totally change the calculus that the smaller member states uh, would have to uh, to get into in order to decide what benefit they get from the union. So yeah, they uh, it puts Germany in a uh, in a worse spot. Just as if California were to leave, that would put the rest of the taxpaying net taxpayer states in a worse spot. Um, I think it was Larry Summers who who said that um, the EU was going to have a challenge uh, now that they didn't have uh, what did he say? Uh, basically, the input of the UK. Uh, or something like that. But what he really meant, I think, 
what's their balance sheet or their payrolls, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> so much of it's about money, and it's really it's so long has it been for the last twenty or thirty years, basically a welfare scheme where we're going to increase European unity uh, by moving money from the wealthier states to the poorer states, and that'll that'll make the the poorer states indebted to us. Uh, uh, EU people, those of us who run Brussels, and uh, it will also, of course, as you noted, uh, increase chances for expanding markets for large established firms in the richer countries. And then, of course, they can make huge loans, um, which uh, have to be paid back at some point with interest. And then, of course, if it looks like those loans aren't going to get pay paid back, we'll just put the taxpayer on the hook and make the taxpayer pay for some bailouts, either in terms of just outright uh, cash transfers or uh, by inflating the currency through the European Central Bank. So that was a large part of what was behind uh, all that Greek stuff that the Germans uh, were getting annoyed with, was the Greeks didn't want to pay back their debts. And uh, so rather than just have them default on the debts, well, we'll just bail them out then um, and attach a lot of strings to the bailout, of course. But we can't just let them default. Well, we have to bail them out because there's a lot of rich people in Germany who own that debt. So it's got to get paid back somehow. Who's going to pay for it? Well, the German taxpayer or the other taxpayers. Right. Uh, I want to move to the U.S., but just before uh, we move on, I want to ask you uh, how important was it was the fact that the U.K. retained their currency and their military in their ability to, to basically half a, ref, half a referendum and walk away? Well, it was fairly important. It, it makes it easier. I don't think it's totally essential. After all, other countries just continue uh, or have used the dollar, even though they're not affiliated with the U.S., like Ecuador, for example. Um, and lots of places, when their local currencies start to get in trouble, they just use the dollar. I, there's no reason necessarily that if the U.K. were on the euro that it couldn't have withdrawn and continued to use uh, the euro at least temporarily. Now you cede some local control, of course, when you're using somebody else's currency because now you're just totally at the uh, mercy of a foreign central bank. Um, but uh, they could have made the change and then gradually shifted over to uh, the old currency or a new currency. That definitely is a problem, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make the secession impossible. I noted in a column this week on Mises.org how the UK was also lucky in this case in that, and all EU member states are lugging the fact that there's not direct taxation for the most part from the EU and that uh, Frenchmen and Brits don't pay taxes directly to some European version of the IRS. Unlike Americans where everybody has to pay taxes first to DC and then DC spends some of that back in uh, the state of origin, uh, Europe's not, was never got quite to that point where Brits paid a bunch of money into Brussels and then some of that money got spent back in the UK. So by, simply by leaving, uh, they're just simply keeping more money at home since the UK was required as a member state to, to pay a certain portion of its budget uh, to Brussels. So they, perhaps they caught it early enough. Um, I, I want to talk about the US, but uh, one last thought actually. I, I know that uh, you and uh, Jeff talked about uh, sort of uh, the precedent or the, sort of the historical significance of this, um, the, the fact that this was peaceful, the fact that it was handled with, with, uh, with a referendum is quite significant, I think. And it's not like the USSR in the sense that, you know, the USSR sort of just melted down, sort of like building a society on communism is like building a city on a volcano, right? Eventually the thing erupts and the thing just melts down. This was more like, uh, you know, a tax farm where the sheep got together and had a meeting and decided that they were gonna act they acted on a certain day, opened the gate, and walked out and, uh, <laughs> and flipped off the farmer on the way out. Do, do you attach any significance to the fact that how deliberate it was? Uh, well, I think there's value there. Uh, the fact that it hasn't quite gotten to the point where there's just simply no respect uh, for local democratic institutions. Now, of course, I know a lot of, in, a lot of libertarians are down on democracy. Uh, but of course, democracy isn't all isn't all the same thing. Swiss democracy is nothing like American democracy in terms of its uh, how locally based it is and uh, the way in which it's conducted. And so we can't just make some general statement about it. But yeah, if we, if we look at this situation, it seems to be where people who were actually paying the bills got together and they expressed their uh, disagreement with the way the EU was doing things. Now, now, of course, people in the Soviet Union 
uh, didn't have those options. They didn't have those institutions for communicating that sort of dissatisfaction. Had they, the Soviet Union probably would have broken up sooner. What did happen in the Eastern Bloc was that Poland actually had an election, which was contrary to Soviet law. But rather than send in the tanks, as the Soviet Union had always done in the past, every time a uh, client state had attempted to assert uh, some democratic control, uh, the Soviet Union was too weak to do anything. So they said, oh, let the Poles have their election and they can just do their own independent thing. And that's when the whole situation snowballed. And uh, so fortunately, that was bloodless to a certain extent. But it took much longer, I think, just because there was really no respect for local control or anything like that in the Eastern Bloc. And there was there's still some respect for national governments uh, over the EU government uh, when we look at uh, the EU situation. Okay, and then finally, um, you know, once in a while I hear on the news ideas about people of Texas uh, getting ideas about independence, uh, so-called Texit, it's, it's being called now. What are your thoughts about the feasibility of something like that, not just in Texas, but in, in the U.S. in general? Uh, well, could, could this happen? Uh, yes, I think it could, but not not tomorrow um, and not this year. I think what you need is, is a significant weakening in federal institutions before states uh, start to break off. For now, uh, the feds are managing to, to hold together appearances quite well in that, the, 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 you know, if you're just an ordinary person, it doesn't seem that the U.S. government is bankrupt or that it's going to stop. Uh, paying its bills anytime soon. Inflation hasn't gotten to the point where your social security check is becoming less valuable by the week. But I think once you got to a situation where inflation started to really take off, another situation might be where uh, interest rates have to go up in order to continue financing the debt. And, and of course, what that means is foreigners stop buying American debt, so they have to raise uh, the interest rates on government debt, and that raises everybody's interest rates uh, to attract people in, or, in order to purchase government debt, and that's the only way then to, to fund the debt. And so once that happens, then you've got to take huge amounts of money from the U.S. budget and devote them to debt service rather than to all these welfare payments that keep people loyal to the U.S. government. So once people start to see their welfare payments, their military spending, all of these government grants and so on that go into uh, to state governments or to local governments, people are going to suddenly question, well, why do we care so much about this federal government? What, what are they doing for us? And so once that starts to happen, then you'll start to see like actual chance of real secession taking place. But as long as people are just not seeing any big problem with the status quo in terms of the money flowing from the feds, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of that. Are you saying you think that the federal government will favor uh U.S. creditors ahead of, say, Social Security recipients? Uh, yes, I am saying <laughs> Yes, I think that would be the case. I think they would inflate uh, and, uh, and make sure that they were paying their creditors uh, and keeping the financial sector fine uh, before they would start worrying about the size of uh, people's Social Security checks. Okay, but wouldn't that be sort of uh, shafting both ends, basically? Oh, not sure. Not honoring yeah, one involved, I, dishon uh, not honoring the other. It's, well, and it's, it's just how do you choose to default, right? Obviously, going off the gold standard in 1971 was a type of default. Uh, going, um, or going, closing the gold window in 71 was a type of default. Closing or ending the gold standard back in the 30s was a type of default. We, we talk about how the U.S. has never defaulted, but that's not true. The U.S. has done a number of partial defaults. And then, of course, if the U.S. inflates away the value of its commitments in terms of the money it promised to Social Security recipients and uh, Medicare recipients and so on, then that's a type of default as well. Um, it could choose to do instead default on the national debt, and that would be something else. But, but default of some type is inevitable. The question is, how do they choose to do it? Um, but once you you start to uh, do that, and once it becomes evident to the population over overall, then I think you start to see people genuinely asking for either serious decentralization or some type of secession. Now, all outright secession might not happen for a variety of reasons. You might instead see parts of the country want to just become autonomous regions of the U.S. and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that's probably more likely, uh, but certainly might happen. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to let it go on that somewhat sour note. Uh, but thank you very much for joining me on the program. I always enjoy speaking with you, so I hope we can do it again soon.
Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. And my guest has been Ryan McMakin of the Mises Institute. Uh, please check out their website at Mises.org. And that's the Power and Market Report for Friday, July 1st. I'm Albert Liu. Till next time, take care. Hi, I'm Albert Liu, host of the Power and Market Report. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe to my channel by clicking the button on the top left uh, of the screen. And don't forget, you can also visit us on Facebook and at powerandmarket.com. Thanks again for watching.